from MTN, the Montana Television Network, in partnership with Montana PBS. This is Campaign 2014, The House Debate. Made possible thanks to support from the Greater Montana Foundation. The Greater Montana Foundation, founded by Montana broadcasting pioneer Ed Craney, supports communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to all Montanans. Bait night here on the Montana Television Network. We thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm Jay Cohn. I'll be moderating tonight's debate as we look at the U.S. House race here in Montana between Republican Ryan Zinke and Democrat John Lewis. This is a big uh, week for this campaign. These two candidates met in a radio debate earlier this week in Billings, but tonight is the only televised face-to-face -face debate between the two candidates, at least that we know of at this speaking. We'd like to welcome our audience tonight statewide on the Montana Television Network stations. We're also coming to you statewide on Montana PBS stations across the state of Montana. And we're also going nationwide tonight on C-SPAN. So wherever our viewers are tuning in, we uh, welcome you to Montana's U.S. House debate. Just a few uh, ground rules to go over. We'll have no opening statements tonight. The candidates will be asking, uh, answering questions from our panelists. We'll be giving 60 seconds for those answers and each candidate will then have a 30 second rebuttal. They'll have two minutes for a closing statement. They will be taking a one minute break midway through. Some quick ground rules for our audience. We're here from the Riverside Country Club in Bozeman with a small group of uh, campaign friends, family on both sides of the aisle here. We are asking everyone to hold their applause to the very end. We're all adults and we're not going to answer our cell phones during this debate as well. <laughs> Let's do our first introduction, first of all, for Republican nominee Ryan Zinke. Ryan, nice to see you here. Ryan is a third generation Montanan. He is a standout athlete at Whitefish High School. He was a standout in several sports. He went to the University of Oregon on an athletic scholarship, earning a degree in geology, a Bachelor of Science degree. He's had a 23-year career with the military in the U.S. Navy, two stints with the Navy SEALs. In 2008, he was elected to the Montana State Senate, where he chaired the Senate Education Committee, and just a couple of years ago, he ran for lieutenant governor. He is also the CEO of a consulting firm that specializes in advanced technology for aerospace and oil and gas. He and his uh, wife, Lolita, have three children. Ryan, welcome tonight. Great to be here. Now we welcome uh, Democratic nominee John Lewis. John is a fourth generation Montana and he and his wife Melissa have two children, Kate and Jackson. John Lewis was born in Billings, a Magic City boy, but he was raised in both Billings and Missoula. Most recently he served as state director for Senator Max Baucus, a position he held for four years, supervising a staff of 20. He's a graduate of Western Washington University with a degree in political science and communications. And he touts his uh, top legislative accomplishments as uh, tackling veterans unemployment issues and also helping many Montana communities wade through the bureaucratic red tape for flood disaster following the 2011 floods in Montana. John Lewis, good to see you tonight. Good to see you, Jay. And it's my pleasure to introduce you now to our panel who will be asking our candidate questions. First, we welcome Donna Kelly, right in the middle of our, uh, on this end of our panel questioning. Donna is from KBZK Television. She's been with the Bozeman Station now for eight years. Donna also worked prior to that for many years with CNN in Atlanta. And she wanted me to tell you that she also had several overtures to work for Fox as well during those years. I can tell you that Donna and I started our television careers together, let's just say many decades ago at a small television station in Helena, Montana. Donna, good to see you tonight. Jill Valley is sitting in the middle of our panel tonight. Jill is from KPAX TV. She's been anchoring the news there for 22 years. She is a six time Montana broadcaster of the year. Jill, good to see you tonight. Last, certainly not least, is my co-anchor at KTVQ Television in Billings. Please welcome Janelle Slade. She is a two-time Montana Broadcaster of the Year. She went straight from college to Q2, spent a few years on the dark side in communications and public relations, but we welcomed her back to Q2 a couple of years ago. So that is our panel tonight. But I get the first question, and let's get going because we just have one hour to get through this. I'm sorry that took as long as it did. John Lewis, we flipped coins, and you get the first question tonight, at least answering it, and it comes from me. As we speak, Congress has an 8% approval rating. The calling card of Congress is 
partisan gridlock. This is a do-nothing Congress on steroids, this past Congress. So my question is, why in the world do you want to join this esteemed group? And what can you do, what do you bring to the table to change this culture in Washington that has our country stuck on hold? Sure, thank you very much, Jay. I want to thank Montana News Stations for hosting this debate and welcome Donna and Jill and Janelle for being panelists. When I first got in this race, I gave a speech, one of the earliest events I did, and I talked about my past experiences and, and things I learned <laughs> while um, working on legislation for trying to help veterans and other experience I had fighting for Montanans. Someone came up to me after this speech and said, uh, I respect your past, your past experiences, but I'm more interested in the future and the ideas you have to get Congress working for Montana and how you're going to be part of the solution. That was great advice. We've run a campaign on Montana ideas. We've released plans for agriculture, for energy, for public lands, and that's what I want to see Congress do, is work on solutions to move Montana forward. It's true, Congress has about a 9% approval rating. I read somewhere that cockroaches and root canals have a higher standing than 9%. Root canals. We can do better than that. I'm a concerned father, I've got two young kids, I'm concerned about their future. And I wanna see Congress work together again on solutions. That's why I'm running. Ryan, you sure after this you still want this job? <laughs> well, the 21st century can and will be an American century, uh, but we're going to have to earn it. You know, where I wear a Navy SEAL trident in my chest, there's a saying in the SEALs that you have to earn your trident every day. And in our country, we have to relearn how to earn our liberty and have an economy that we can have jobs and obtain the American dream. And it is about the American dream and families. And in Montana, we struggle. Our nation struggles. No one trusts the government. No one trusts Congress. No one trusts the administration. We have to restore trust. We have to make sure our economy is prosperous. And today's debate, I think, will highlight some different contrasts between the candidates, and I think the choice will be clear. Mr. Lewis, any rebuttal for either one? Well, I've, like I said, focused this campaign on the future and ideas on the future. And so far in the campaign, uh, I've heard very little about ideas for the future from my opponent. Um, I've heard about what he was doing in 1988. This race is not about what we were doing in 1988. I've heard that he loves America, and we all love America and Montana. And I look forward to hearing his ideas about how we're going to strengthen public lands in this country. And if you want to see Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, repealed, well, then what's your plan for ensuring the millions of Americans that don't have insurance in this country, including 179,000 Montanans? What's the plan? That's what I look forward to hearing tonight. Ryan. Well, let's talk about the debt. Your plan about selling used cars and abandoned buildings and cutting congressional pay is a joke. It's not even a rounding error. If we want to get serious about America and restoring America, we're going to have to address the debt. And yes, I do support the Ryan plan as a framework because I think balancing the budget in 10 years is obtainable. There's a lot I don't agree with it. I think we can do it without challenging and eliminating and cutting Medicare. I think we can do it without cutting Social Security. I think we can do it without cutting education. But I do think that we have to address the challenges and not put our head in the stand. It's been too long since we put our head in the sand. And I do think we can work together, Democrats, Republicans, independents, to carve out a better future because everyone knows we're in trouble. So are we going to ignore the problems, or are we going to actually address them? And tonight we'll talk about addressing the issues. Speaking of issues, let's get right to it. Donna Kelly, you have the first question. Now for you, Mr. Davis, uh, Mr. Lewis, first question. So with your military background, and over the last couple of days, there's been a firestorm over Leon Panetta's book. Just came out about a day and a half ago or so, and everybody's talking about a Democratic congressman who was a former CIA director in the Obama administration, a former Secretary of Defense, and he is laying this squarely at the feet of the administration, the Obama administration, for not getting in those negotiations with Iraqi Prime Minister al-Maliki so that we had to leave. So I'll get to that question with you, Mr. Lewis, but let's talk with your military background. 
how long could we stay if Al Maliki was not willing to let us stay there? Can you just camp out and stay? And who's going to pay for it? Well, yeah, good question on that. I think, I think you know, I was reluctant to enter Iraq uh, because I, my daughter's a Navy diver, my son-in-law is a Navy SEAL. Hey, there's no one more reluctant to go to war than me. But if you go to war, you make sure you go to war to win. You get the rules of engagement so our troops in, the fee in harm's way can and will win. In the case of Iraq leaving, we not only left early, we left without a SOFA agreement, which is a status of forces agreement. And that should not be overlooked. That one agreement allows our soldiers, they get prosecuted if they are allegedly conducted something wrong under our judicial system. Without a status of forces agreement, one of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine, could actually get prosecuted under Islamic law. Or if a pilot errors and has collateral damage. He could be prosecuted perhaps for murder rather than under our UCMJ. And also control and status and stability. You look what's happening with ISIS today. We're going to fight ISIS. And I'd rather fight ISIS in the deserts of Iraq than the streets of America. And it's already here. Ask the gal from, from Great Falls who had her head severed if you could ask her because that's ISIS. get through the, through the negotiations. There was multiple opportunities to stay. There was multiple opportunities for, for our administration to get involved, and they chose not to. There was multiple opportunities to check ISIS at the beginning, and we chose not to. This is what happens when you lead from the rear and not from the front, because if the United States does not lead, no one else will. Would you have supported the administration when they said, we're going to have to pull out, we don't have anything on paper that we can stay, and then it's progressed to this point where now are we playing catch up in the game, uh, fighting ISIS with airstrikes, and trying to get back territory that we already spent a lot of blood and treasure on? Look, the safety of Americans is our number one priority, and ISIS does not share our values, and they obviously have no regard for human life. Uh, but we need to learn from the mistakes of the last 12 years of nation building in Iraq. And when I hear I'd rather fight that war in the deserts of Iraq uh, than here at home, I think that's a simplistic way of looking at the problem. They estimate there are one billion Muslims in this world. They're not all in that region. One billion Muslims. Out of that one billion, they say about 15 percent are Islamic extremists. If it's 15 percent, that's 150 million Islamic extremists. The idea that we can just bomb our way out of this problem is not realistic to me. For both of you, airstrikes now to try and gain back some of the ground that ISIS has taken, but will there have to be boots on the ground? Look, I support doing whatever we need to do to keep our Americans safe, and the security is our number one priority. That's what I said first. But we need to be thoughtful about our approach. And number one, Congress needs to debate this issue and authorize force, fulfill their constitutional responsibility. And how much is it going to cost? What's the budget? What's the end game? And I just don't think the correct response is to instantly say we need to put troops on the ground in Iraq. My opponent called for economic sanctions against ISIS. Now tell me how you put economic sanctions against a non-nation state. Maybe we should perhaps write a tersely worded letter. The issue is that ISIS is a danger. It's a danger to here. I think you have to have a three-pronged approach. You have to shut down our southern border. Our, our southern border is no longer an immigration issue. It's a security and an immigration threat. A nation that can build a Panama Canal in the 19th century certainly can build a fence in the 21st. Secondly, unfortunately, it's going to call for America to lead. And you cannot control ISIS by air alone. In the words of General Conway, four-star, former commandant of the Marine Corps, there isn't a snowball's chance in hell that air operations will work. And I agree. Secondly, you limit our, our ground forces to special forces, to supply and support. We make sure our coalitions that we choose are watched and efficiently trained and limit our involvement, to make, but make sure that ISIS is destroyed. Quick follow-up, because no one answered how we're paying for this. We've already put two wars on the credit card. Would you be willing to support a, so, a war tax to support 
as Donna said, a perpetual war that we seem to be in. Look, there's two clear, clearly different approaches to this situation here on this issue. And I'm saying we need to be thoughtful and responsible in decisions. No, a letter is not going to get the job done. But this is somebody who called for invading Mexico a few weeks ago because we have an American in jail in Tijuana. That's not the kind of judgment I want representing me in Congress. And his instant reaction to the president's announcement that we would have airstrikes was, let's send in more troops. He also said a couple years ago that when the president announced that women should serve in combat roles in this country, he said, that is nearly certain to cost lives, nearly certain to cost lives, women serving in combat roles. That's not the judgment we need in Congress. And it's a good question, Jay. How much is this going to cost? And it's, it needs to be debated in Congress and authorized. Quick rebuttal, Ryan. How do we pay for this? We pay for it by having a strong economy. A Navy costs money. Bridges, schools, infrastructure. That all costs money, paying for Medicare, Social Security. We need a robust economy. And John, I know you didn't serve, but Tiramisu is a Marine that has been languishing in a prison in Mexico for over six months. Every man, woman, and I've served both, and I've commanded both. Everybody that serves in this country makes sure that America has their back. And when America doesn't have their back, like Benghazi, like Mexico, what happens is it sends a signal to every veteran fighting, you know what, America's not going to be there. I did not advocate invading Mexico. I advocated the president doing his duty and doing by all available means to get the young Marine back. Next question goes to Jill Valley. All right, I'm going to start with Mr. Lewis talking about money a little bit. You've criticized Mr. Zinke for taking 70% of his money from out of state outside of Montana because it makes him captive to out of state interests. Well, John Tester got 80% of his money in that same vein. So is he too also captive to out of state interests? The reason I've highlighted that I've taken over 70% of the money that I've raised in this race is from Montana is because it's unusual. And I'm proud of that, very proud. I've worked very hard to raise and finance this campaign for Montana. And there's a huge difference between the way I've done it and the way my opponent has done it. He has raised most of his money from California, Texas, and Florida, three states. And those three states combined have 116 representatives in Congress. We have one, one representative. Look. I said from the beginning, we're going to run a Montana campaign on Montana ideas and financed by Montanans. And I've worked very hard at that, including contribution from all 56 counties. So I'm very proud of, of, of that record. And uh, comparing it to the 2012 election is comparing apples and oranges. In that election, $50 million was spent in Montana in the Senate race alone. That's disgusting to most Montanans. And so we're going to keep doing what we're doing, focusing on Montana ideas, and focusing on running a Montana race financed by Montanans. Well, I'm not going to apologize for having a national stage. I'm not going to apologize for going to different states and having coalitions between different congressmen. But the facts are this. I have 18,000 donors. Most of them are small donors. That 18,000 donors compared to about three represents veterans and seniors that share a common idea that America is exceptional. Do I like the fact that you have to reach out of the state? No. Max Bach has had about 90 percent. No one criticizes that. But the fact of the matter is having a national platform means you can do national things. That means you can reach into coalitions and meet other congressmen. Because we only have one congressman in the state of Montana. One out of 435, not a lot of vote. You're going to need to gain coalitions, friendships, relationships based on American exceptionalism. Our next question goes to Janelle. And this is for Mr. Zinke. I'd like to address where most of our Montana voters see the two of you, and that's on television in political ads. Mr. Zinke, in one of your ads, you repeatedly reference your milestones in life versus John Lewis's age. All of your milestones 
getting through your life as he's growing up. Can you help us with the message that you are trying to get across in this ad? Yeah, more leadership, less politics. I've spent my life leading. I have an MBA, an MS in finance. I've done education. Being a naval officer is more than just leading troops into combat. It's also looking at challenging, complex problems and finding solutions that are real. I've sat down with warlords and, and agreed back and forth on solutions. I can certainly sit down between Democrats and Republicans, as I did in the Senate, to find real solutions. You continually bring up his age. Do you feel that because you are older, you make a better leader? So the older someone is, the better leader they are? No, I, I, bring up the, I bring up a comparison of two lives, and it's a positive campaign. Uh, it, and I've had a lot of experience. I've done a lot of things in my life. I've been more than a Washington staffer. I've been more than, than you know, in politics. I've been a business guy. I understand the private side. I've been an educator. I understand education curriculum. I know how to lead. And I'm, most of all, I know how to solve problems, because the problems faced in our country are large and daunting. But they are fixable. I mean, we created them, and we can fix them. John Lewis, rebuttal. Look, age is arbitrary. What you stand for and why you're running for this position is not. If you were running against Teddy Roosevelt, he'd tell him he was too young. If he was running against Ronald Reagan, he'd tell him he was too old. Look, I can't do anything about the fact that I was born in 1978. But my experience is very relevant to what we're trying to do here. I've worked on legislation in D.C., helping veterans. I've worked on issues right here in Montana. I've been to all 56 counties, helping seniors get a Social Security check. So that experience is very relevant. Age, look, I go back to what I said in the very beginning here. This election is about the future, what ideas you have for the future, not what you were doing in the 80s and 90s. Uh, follow up on uh, as long as we're talking about the congressional ads. Let's talk about uh, your ad, Brian Zinke. Can we just agree right now that John Lewis did not write the Affordable Care Act? Well, being being this, he didn't write it all. But being the state director, it was his job to make sure the values and the interests were reflected in that bill. And when Montana concerned Mon Montana businesses called, what were they what were they what were they told? They were told, you know what, don't grow your business past 50. Make sure you don't employ your, your employees more than 30 hours. That hurts business, that hurts every family. And, and as a state director, that's your responsibility. But your ad says that he wrote it. That's not what, what you just described, isn't it? On a typewriter. Says, On a typewriter. <laughs> so that's not true. I don't think he wrote it all. John, you have an ad campaign that says uh, you want to cut congressional pay. Can we just agree right now no one's going to cut congressional pay because it's going to take an act of Congress to cut congressional pay? Yeah. And really, what would that accomplish? Well, first of all, let me say something very quickly about health, those health care ads. And look, we have millions of uninsured Americans in this country. And what is the solution to insure those Americans? Um, I'd like to... Uh, there are tens of thousands of Montanans additionally that are benefiting. There's somebody in the audience tonight, he's named Al Kesselheim. He's a part-time teacher, lost his insurance January, and he signed up on the exchange for insurance today. Uh, and he's paying half of what he paid before. There's thousands of Montanans like that. So if you want to repeal Obamacare, if you want to repeal the legislation, what are you going to tell Al and his family and his kids what he's going to do, because he would lose that insurance. Well, we're not cutting congressional pay. That was the Look, question. Congress has a 9% approval rating. They need to do their part. Will it solve our deficit issues? No. But I also said that if you can't pass a budget, you shouldn't get paid. Congress hasn't passed a budget in over 1,000 days. And so, look, this is about Congress doing their part. Ryan, quick rebuttal. Well, there's 20,000 Montanans that lost their insurance. 20,000. Yeah, there are. And, and let, let, me, let me further say this. Is it, do we need affordable health care? Absolutely. Can we do it better? Absolutely. But one size fits all from Washington isn't the solution. 
I understand there's some good things about Obamacare, pre-existing conditions, that's good. But we're going to see more and more people lose their insurance. What makes you think that if you couldn't ins afford insurance before, that all of a sudden you magically get a subsidy and you have a $9,000 deductible? What makes you think you can pay that $9,000 deductible if you can't afford insurance in the beginning? You can't. So there are a lot of ways to make sure we have affordable health care. Pooling, tort reform, look at individual health care accounts, low-cost clinics. There are a number of things that make a difference to Montana, which is an aging population. Okay, we're going to get into right. Obamacare, I'm sure, later. <laughs> Next question. I think we have time for one more question before we go to break. Donna, your turn. Okay. As long as we brought up age, <laughs> some of us are rapidly approaching Social Security. And others, certainly, we've done it for, for decades and decades and talked about as the holy grail, don't touch it. But for those of us who are getting close, and yes, that's me raising my hand, the ball keeps moving down the field. You know, it's 62, then it's 65, then it's 70, and a percentage that you're going to get. Would you change it? Can we keep it? How would you make it better? And, can, and are you going to keep moving the ball? And I've lost track of who gets that first. I'm sorry. Mr. Zinke. Well, I think we can keep our promises uh, to Social Security. And I sat down with McCaters Institute and looked at the numbers. And Social Security is absolutely healthy for those that earned it. If you worked all your life and that was a promise made, that portion of Social Security can be healthy. But what's happened is you have a lot of new people, holes in the ship that are draining, draining that, that fund out. And Congress has stole from it multiple times. And, I, and, I, and again, it goes back to how are we going to afford all these things? We need a robust economy. And how do you get a robust economy? You have to look at making sure government goes back in its roles so America can innovate, think out of the box again. The regulatory environment, not through Congress, but just the regulatory burden on business in one year, 2012, was $3.6 trillion. One year. When you look at that amount of overburden regulation, doesn't involve clean air, clean water, it's just stifling innovation. And secondly, energy independence. I'm an optimist. If we focus on those two things, then we can keep the promises. We can make sure we honor our veterans, the pledges. And there's a lot of expenses out there. But $18 trillion, I think 10 years to balance the budget is a reasonable amount of time. I think we can accelerate our economy to make sure we have a prosperous economy moving forward and we can fix it. I'm positive we can. This right here is the clock. When it gets to zero, that's 60 seconds and that was about a minute 30 on your answer. Oh, I have one left. John, your rebuttal. I, I didn't hear an answer in that response about Social Security. Um, one in five Montanans enjoy the benefits of Medicare and Social Security. If we do nothing today, the Social Security Trust Fund will be solvent until 2033. But we do need to do something and keep it solvent for many years after that. I support an idea that's endorsed by AARP, and that's to raise the payroll tax cap. And for people that make over $117,000, they need to continue to pay into that Social Security Trust Fund so we can keep it solvent. For those that have... For how long? For... Is, uh, for well, be more specific, Donna. How long? You said they need to keep paying if they're if they're making over a hundred grand. They need to keep paying into it for how long? I, I think age? we should Ever? all do our part. Absolutely, do all do our part with the goal of making that trust fund solvent for many years beyond 2033. Okay, we're going to drill down real quick on the retirement age. Do you support raising the retirement age? That's a way to help pay for some of this. Is that something you would look at? Or a percentage? Right. No, I do not at this time. Look, people work their lives for these benefits. They need the assurance that it's going to be there for them when they retire. And let's not keep moving the goalposts for retirees. Uh, I don't support that. Ryan? I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary. And, and, I, and I would not support it because, again, is that the, the Social Security program itself, if you just look at those who have earned it, and most of Montanans have earned it over, over a period of their lives. And that's the way it was designed. And it's solvent if you look at that. And I think it should go back and make Social Security exactly what it was. It's 
for those people that have earned it over a period of time, it will be there. And we make, have to make sure we keep our promises. And I'm the guy that's trying to save it. I'm trying to guide that's, that's making sure we're financially solvent, save Medicare, save Social Security, so the check clears. And with that, we're about halfway through our debate. We want to invite you back. We're taking a one-minute break. You're watching the U.S. House debate statewide here in the Montana Television Network. We'll be right back. <laughs> 